My name is Harlan Carvey. I'm going to be presenting uh, this morning before lunch regarding incident response on NTN 2000. Um, after lunch, I'm going to go into a little more detail on, a, on the subject of hiding data on NTN 2000. Uh, so there's going to be things later on in this presentation that we're going to skip over a little bit because we're going to go into detail after lunch. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I've got my email address up here. Um, some of these slides, not very many of them, but some of them have been updated. So what I've done is I put them up on my website. I've got some, uh, some demos are listed uh, that we're going to do in this class and the follow-on presentation as well. The demos are actually listed in, uh, in the zipped archive and I'll make these available through the Black Hat website as well. So, but again, I, I, I didn't make any you know, major radical changes or anything like that. Okay, so what is, what is incident response? What are we talking about when we refer to incident response? This is what we're going to cover today. Now, some of the information at the very beginning might seem a little dry, it might seem a little bit repetitive because we're going to talk about policies. But to be honest, it's really, really very important. As we go through the presentation today, I'm actually going to use, uh, I guess, what I call from my military experience, war stories. Things that I've really been through, uh, experiences that I've had. Uh, hopefully those will strike a chord with you and uh, maybe shed some light on some questions that you have. So uh, also at any time during the presentation you have a question, please feel free to ask if something's not clear or whatever the case may be. Also we want to look at how does forensics fit into incident response. Okay, from the perspective that I'm presenting from, forensics is actually a subset of incident response. Okay, I just want to make that uh, definition kind of clear. I don't want anybody to have the misconception that I'm going to actually be running a hands-on lab on how to use safe back and in case up here. That's not the case. Uh, and you'll see that as we go through. And then we're going to talk about who actually performs these incident response activities. We're going to see that incident response actually covers a lot of different areas. We're going to talk about who performs those activities. Okay, again, what is incident response? We have a definition. Uh, this is the definition I used. Uh, I, worked, I used to work for a large telecom company uh, in Northern Virginia that unfortunately no longer exists. Um, and this is the definition I use when I set up the incident response process at that company. So are there any questions at this point? Okay. Okay, this is what I call the incident response continuum. And this is what it looks like from your left to your, to, to your right all the way through the entire spectrum. Okay. On your far right, prosecution, that's the ultimate. In incident response, if an incident happens, you might need to prosecute somebody. That's as far as you can go. Okay, on your left though, actually uh, I, I found this really neat graphic to place up there instead. And it, it has, um, I think it very clearly represents some of the instances that I've run across. For instance, in, uh, the end of February of 2000, I got a call in my office, uh, I was a security consultant at the time, I got a call in my office from somebody at a, at a corporate entity, um, I won't name any names, but the system administrator was having some trouble. So as I spoke to him, it turns out that there was a Solaris box running a news server sitting outside the firewall, not in the DMZ, outside the firewall on the raw internet. Now this individual informed me that he'd been mon you know, managing and administering Solaris type boxes for a long time. He's, he's pretty much an expert is what he told me. Now I couldn't get any information regarding the business purpose of the system or how it was covered by policies. Now the reason I'm telling you this story is because as I got into the conversation interviewing this man, he informed me that on January 7th of 2000 he had gotten a copy of the Find DDoS tool. Is everybody familiar with that? The FBI tool that came out at the end of 99 or so? Okay, well, some of you aren't. Well, basically it's a, it's a little script that will run through and see if there's a certain type of denial of service, distributed denial of service tool on a Unix box. It was put out by the FBI. So this individual ran that tool and got a positive response and did nothing. Okay, just, just like that. He again, again ran that tool on February 7th, a month later, and again got a positive response. Now I don't know why he waited 30 days, maybe hoping it would, you know, kind of go away. Um, about the middle of February he started receiving emails, quit scanning me, quit sending these denial of service attacks against me. By the time he contacted me, he'd logged into the box as root, hoping to catch this person. But he also had the intention of calling the FBI. Okay. 
So we've progressed beyond you know, the Homer Simpson phase into actually doing something, but it really didn't kind of make a whole lot of sense as to what he was doing. So today's presentation, we're gonna walk through some incident response, and I promise you we're gonna to get to some actual stuff that you can use, some tools and some techniques um, that you can use in your own methodologies before the end of the presentation. So just, just bear with me as we go through this, this uh, presentation. Okay, why do we need incident response? Well, first of all, you want to mitigate the risk or liability associated with an incident that occurs. You want to find out what happened. And what occurred on the box. Um, do, do most of you in here monitor the, the lists on Security Focus? Anybody familiar with those lists? Okay. So you want to find out what happened. Uh, just last week, as a matter of fact, there were two posts, I think on Security Basics list and maybe one on uh, the incidents list. Uh, by Unix admins who had found a NT2000 box that had been supposedly broken into or just was having some sort of problems. So they scanned it with Nmap, okay. And then they went out on the internet and found a list of known Trojan ports. Okay, is that really gonna tell them what happened? No. No, it's not gonna tell them what happened at all. In fact, you know, who knows, uh, in, in one, or two, one or two of the cases, they didn't even announce which version of Windows that they were using. So you really have no idea. I mean, he's gonna find, oh, I found port 5000 open, or I found UDP port 1900 open, and it's this Trojan. Well, yeah, maybe not. Okay, you wanna determine what happens so that you can figure out what you need to do to prevent it from happening again. And then ultimately, if necessary, and you determine who's responsible, and deter depending on the type of incident, as it applies to your policies, you may decide to prosecute. Now, who performs these types of activities? Well, most of you in the audience, most of the people attending Black Hat today are going to be the people that performs these types of activities. Technically oriented people that are gonna collect technical information from the boxes, and that's stuff we're gonna go over at the end of the presentation, okay? And you'll most likely be members of a CERT, either an incident response team or emergency response team, however your organization defines it. But again, just keep in mind, you're gonna be a member of a team. And we'll go into that in the following slides. The components of incident response. First of all, you have to have the policies. You have to have some sort of policy that says, we are going to have an incident response process. We're gonna have an incident response procedure. I wrote one for the company I worked for. And because of the different types of uh, uh, interfaces we had, we had internal systems, we had ISPs, we had dial-up users, we had uh, just, just a mix. We had one ISP that had 13 free BSD servers over next to Purdue University. We had uh, somebody up in Washington State that you know, had an Altrix system. I kid you not, an Altrix system. So we had all these different people, and we had to cover them with our policies and procedures. So basically what I said is, if you have any sort of incident that occurs, call me. That was it, <laughs> you know? At that point, we'll, we'll move on from there. But that's the first step. Um, and again, that, um, that company is no longer around. I guess I can start using the name, Windstar. Is any, any familiar with Windstar? Okay, anyway, it was a telecom company that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we're going to cover the, the different members of the team, kind of uh, what their functionality is and why they're important, and also we're going to talk about some different tools that you can use. Now, throughout uh, yesterday, you were presented with uh, several presentations that talked about different freeware tools, uh, some stuff you have to go out and compile, whatever the case may be, but a lot of these tools that are out there, either freely available from Microsoft or freely, freely available from other sites on the web, are extremely useful. In fact, uh, one of the better tools is actually the author is actually in one of the rooms, other rooms right now, J.D. Glazer. So, uh, we'll talk more about that when we get to that point. Security policies and procedures, what are they? Okay, why are they important? Well, the policies themselves are technology and platform independent statements that come from the guidance, the vision of senior management. You know, they're, they're, policies need to start off with a vision or guidance statement from the president or the CEO of the company or whatever the case may be. It could be something as simple as, we take security seriously. It could be just something as simple as that. But you have to have that guiding statement. And that guiding statement is gonna provide the roadmap for the rest of your policies, the rest of your procedures. Now again, the policies themselves are platform independent statements of what needs to be done. We will use strong authentication is a policy statement. We will use passwords of eight characters or more is a procedure. Okay, that's the definition we're working on here. 
Okay, where do they come from? Now, as one of the presentations discussed yesterday, you're going to get your policies and procedures, or particularly your policies, will come from management. And you also have laws and regulatory bodies that are going to uh, provide some enforcement or provide some stimulus for those policies and procedures. Uh, HIPAA is a good example. The SEC is another example. Now, th this is a big question, and nobody really has to answer it. It's mostly rhetorical. But the question is, do you have policies? Now, some of the obstacles that you might have to policies, um, having been a security consultant, I've been to places that had policies that just weren't enforced. I've also been to places that didn't have policies at all. So there's a lot of obstacles that need to be overcome. Some of those are enforcement. What good is it to have a policy that says thou shalt not if the senior VPs are doing it? Because where, where does that leave the incident response team or where does that leave uh, your organization when you go to fire somebody for a violation of the policies and you've already let your VPs go or you've already let other senior managers get away with these types of things? That, leaves, that in fact will leave you open to liability and risk from lawsuits. Okay? Now I'm not going to get too much into the legal stuff because I'm, I'm not Jennifer Grenick and I'm not an attorney. Okay. The reason we have the procedures following the policies is so that we avoid making it up as we go along. If you take one box and you put an incident on that box, like a test box, and you bring two or three different people in separately to figure out what happened, you're going to see several different uh, methodologies or approaches to it. Now these people can all be from the same IT department, they just have different experiences. Unless you have a procedure for what needs to be done, unless you have it documented in some way, and this is how we're going to do X, Y, and Z. You know, you need to make sure that these things are done the same way by everybody. Do we always do that that way? Now, this is a question that, uh, when I talk to some of the forensics analysts, this is a question that comes up when they go to court. It's not so much what tool did you use, it's more of when you assess or when you analyze evidence, do you always do it this way? Do you always look for X, Y, and Z? They're looking for a methodology. Okay, and you need to understand what happens on a system when you develop your procedures. And what I mean by that is when you're looking for evidence of something uh, that has occurred on the box, when you're looking for the cause, how do you go about it? Do you use tools that will write log files, write temporary files? Do you use tools that will modify the last, ac time, last access time of the file just because you, know, you looked at it in a particular tool? You want to understand what happens on the system. Okay, team members, we talked about this. Who's going to be involved? Okay, again, it's not just going to be the system administrators. It's not just going to be you. You need to have HR representation. You need to have legal representation on the team as well. Now, when I wrote the policies and procedures for Winstar, one of the basis we had for those policies was the fact that about a year prior, legal counsel had put out a statement. And, that, and it was completely independent of information security at that point. But the statement was, the only incidences that will be reported outside the company are three particular types required by federal law. That was child pornography, gambling, and copyright infringement. Now, this is just a statement that legal counsel put out. I'm not, gonna, you know, I'm not qualified to say whether that was good or bad. But that served as the basis for our policies and procedures. So like I said, I told the ISPs, I told the system administrators, you get an incident, you report it to me, and the next step in the process was, if it's one of these three things, I then call the attorney. And we actually had something like that. We had several members in another office emailing around very graphic video files. And for one of these files, on a Friday afternoon at 4.30, I had to call legal counsel over to look at this. So I don't think I need to go any further to describe what was on it. You also need, you also need the involvement from HR. And you, you also need their buy-in. We had one incident at Winstar where an employee left for the day and went out drinking. He came back later that day, about 4.30 or so on a Friday, and found that there was somebody from the help desk working on his computer. Well, there had been a legitimate problem. But this guy was drunk, and he started physically assaulting the help desk guy. 
Okay, at that point, yeah. I, I wasn't there, I didn't see it. At that point, HR confiscated the box, put it in their office. But HR has different um, agendas. Have, they have different needs that need to be met. So what happened was, is by the time we found out about this, this box had been sitting in an HR manager's office for a week and then put back into service, given to another employee. So, you know, from that perspective, we really didn't have buy-in from everybody in HR. We really didn't have, you know, the HR managers uh, buy-in to the procedures and policies. So that's something we needed to work on. We also missed an opportunity, perhaps, to uncover fraud, uncover some sort of illicit activity. But you need to have their buy-in. Now, also, if, you're, if your policies do have an enforcement if, if this type of event happens, if this type of incident happens, and it is shown that this person did it, then they can be verbally reprimanded, they can be uh, reprimanded in some sort of written fashion, all the way up to being terminated or having law enforcement called. You know, you need to have the HR buy-in, at least have them read over, make sure that that's okay. I mean, I'm sure that there's some system administrators out there that if they're left to their own devices to sit in a dark room and write these policies up, the enforcement is going to be, uh, if you use AIM, uh, public caning. If you use a stock ticker, public caning. And that probably isn't going to fly as much as we'd like it to. But uh, you need to have the HR buy-in. You need to have HR you know, at least provide their input. You also need to have legal. Anything that affects the employees themselves addressing any sort of uh, rewards or punishment, for instance. It needs to be addressed by HR and legal. Where do incidences come from? Well, black hat for one. <laughs> I mean, it's some of the information you get here. Uh, last February, J.D. Glazer and, uh, from Foundstone was giving a presentation on web hacking, how to hack through port 80. And we've seen similar things yesterday. We've seen similar presentations. This is, this is where incidences can come from, believe it or not. Uh, user mistakes, administrator mistakes. Depending on which particular survey you read, you know, up to anywhere between 60 to 80 to 90 percent of incidences occur from the inside, from either malicious or just, you know, mistakes made by users. An internal or external attacker, somebody who's actually trying to get some of that data, somebody who's actually trying to, say, uh, destroy a machine, uh, deface a web page. This is where the instances come from. You need to recognize this. And there are a lot of web, source, web resources out there that provide Hacking 101. I mean, that's where we get script kitties. Download this tool, hit this button, run it. Is everybody familiar with Red Button? Yeah, you remember Red Button? Nice little GUI, probably written in what? Visual Basic. You pop it up, and the first dialog says, you're not using this for legal purposes, are you? And it provides yes and no. You know, why bother? But. Um, this type of stuff is out there. A lot of these attacks can be automated very easily. Scans, you know, how many people see whisker scans going through their web pages or web servers? Yeah, you see that all the time. Um, scans for uh, anonymous FTP access with write access to the drive. I mean, you see all these things coming in all the time. Incident step one, compromised services. People trying to get in, you usually see a spike in a particular type of uh, scan or a particular type of attack right after it's announced through some resource. It used to be CERT, but now you've got sites like uh, you know, BugTrack, you've got Security Focus, which consolidates everything in one place. Uh, I've been watching the uh, Security Focus list for quite a while, and I, I participate every now and then. Uh, one thing that really kind of concerns me is system administrators that will get on the site and post from their domain. And they will say things like, and maybe some of you will recognize this. I have 50 plus NT2000 servers in the DMZ. One of them was hit by NIMDA. They're all in different domains, but they have trusts and shares between them. Oh, great. So now I just cut the domain name out of that post and I paste it into a Google search. And I start finding other things like how do I set up Exchange? Um, I've got this SNMP thing that I'm working with. And you find all this information. This is an easy place to, 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 to find out who has services that could be compromised. I mean, this guy's telling us, I've got a machine in my DMZ that's susceptible to NIMDA. Within, I don't know, moments of that post going up, you can probably see scans going out against that guy, looking for his uh, domain name, uh, which, by the way, he also allowed uh, zone transfers from his name server. 
Uh, misuse or abuse. Misuse of resources, abuse of resources, abuse of privilege, what you're allowed to do. System administrators sometimes get a little overzealous. I knew a system administrator in Ohio who's a former cop and it really kind of surprised me because he said, I had a ton of scans, a ton of failed logins to my PDC. And I asked him for the entries out of the event log. He sent me one. And I said, that's a ton? Well, by the time I got into my conversation with him, it turns out that a user in Florida had simply been looking for a print server. That's it. You know, network neighborhood, looking for print servers. Well, the administrator didn't really know what was going on, and by then he'd already known for six months what the incident response procedure was. And even knowing so, and even knowing, having been a former police officer, he mapped that user's drive and started reading through his email to see if somebody had sent him a Trojan. So, misuse. We had a possible, uh, a potential issue go from being somebody trying to maybe break into a PDC to be turned completely around to being misuse of authority, abuse of authority by the system administrator. Uh, we also have local and remote attacks, uh, privilege escalation. There's a lot of tools out there. If uh, you know, most of the system administrators are probably aware that, you know, if you get a, a user that comes to you and says, hey, how do I get or can I have administrator access on my box, that's probably somebody you want to watch. Because if he's got just user access, there's lots of tools out there, NT, 2000, whatever the case may be, all, the one for 2000, pipe up admin, you familiar with that? Anybody? You run pipe up admin, you reboot the box, and the person is now part of the local administrator group? Okay. Privilege escalation. And then maintaining a presence. How do people maintain a presence when they break into NT and 2000 boxes? It's a little different than how they would do so on Linux. The idea is the same, the concept's the same, the actual mechanics of how they do it is a little different. Uh, most of you that are familiar with uh, a lot of the Trojans out there, if you go through some of the antivirus sites, you'll see the same registry keys popping up over and over again. You know, the run key, the run once key, over and over again. Um, Putting Trojans on the system, maintaining persistence, how do you keep them there? Vulnerabilities and exploits. There's a lot of places on the web, as I said, to go find this type of information. Not only how to do it, but also finding potential targets. Security focus is probably one of the best, believe it or not. Now, I'm not trying to disparage security focus, it's an excellent resource. It's great. But because of you know, you just have a lot of users from all over the world, um, not only posting, but you have a lot of people that just read, that just view it. It's an excellent place to go to find potential victims. You've got hacker exploit websites, but then we've got credibility issues with those types of websites. Is the information accurate? Is it up to date? Uh, you might see uh, vulnerability announcements coming out from somebody that actually it's uh, an issue that was two years old and it was addressed then and they just were using an unpatched version of the application, whatever the case may be. And antivirus websites are an excellent place to go to get information about different types of malware, for instance. I prefer, uh, personally, I usually check F-Secure first because it has a lot of detailed information. And then I will go try to uh, correlate that information amongst other antivirus websites as well. Other web resources, again, we got Security Focus, particular to NT and 2000, we have NT Bug Track. Uh, the Packet Storm Security Site, still, still pretty good, still pretty good. Uh, the Microsoft Security Site, believe it or not, is an excellent resource. One of the things I usually do as a consultant for uh, during vulnerability assessments, for instance, is we do interviews. And I like to ask the system administrators, how many people here subscribe to the security bulletins? Either one-on-one -on -one or, yeah, okay. Uh, I, I've actually been to, to sites associated with the, uh, the federal government that said, no, we don't. There's too many of them. Really? Well, the night I heard that, I went back to my hotel room, dialed in, got my email, had two announcements, and within five seconds to determine if they applied to that customer or not. Do they use the application? It was that easy. Yeah, there is a lot of information. Yeah, you do have to do some research, but the Microsoft site does provide a lot of excellent information regarding the security of your systems. And uh, Secure Team is another good one. Use that one before. Incident preparation. This is key. This is a key component of incident response. Default installation of NT or 2000 really isn't capable 
of preventing numerous incidences from occurring, either externally or internally. With incident preparation, by configuring your systems, you can not only prevent a great deal of the incidences occurring, but you can detect when one of, say, a new class comes out, you can possibly detect that and have some time to react by slowing the configuration of your system will slow down the attack, will make the attack less effective, and you'll get some sort of information and that you can respond to, detailed information. So how do you prepare? You want to start out with your policies again. You want to have your password settings. Yeah, do you, have you used, uh, is anybody familiar with the StrongPass DLL from ntsecurity.nu? Okay, we got one person. But if you want to add complexity, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge proponent for automating a lot of things. I like to prototype the things I do on NT2000 in Perl, believe it or not. Uh, the website I presented at the beginning, there's actually a Perl page. It's got a lot of the Perl scripts that I use in my presentations and demos are up on the website, just available for anybody. Um, some of the things I've run across in the past are um, system administrators who have written Perl scripts for users to change their passwords. And the actual script itself addresses the complexity rather than uh, settings on in tier 2000. So rather than going out and loading the other DLLs, the password isn't accepted until it passes through the regular expressions in the utility itself. So they've got a way of adding the, to the complexity of the password. They're preparing for instances. If the passwords are harder to guess, then it's less likely that somebody's going to get in the first time unless, of course, the password's just given out. And that goes back to our policies. Documentation. How have you configured the boxes? Um, with the, the gentleman from NIST that spoke the other day, yesterday he talked about the .inf files that they have. That's great documentation. If you use a particular .inf file, and you either uncomment or comment out some of the settings, that's great documentation. Hey, I ran this file on this box, this tells me what the settings are. Now also with the documentation of how the systems are set up, that allows us to go back and then verify that configuration to see if any changes have been made. Which you can do on a regular basis, you can do it automated, and you can have that information provided to you after the test is run. Okay, it's easy to change a process, it's easy to change something that we know. If you just send a system administrator off to set up a box, and there's no documentation on how it was done or what was done or what settings you made. I, I'll give you a, uh, an excellent example of this. Uh, Winstar used to have a data center and they had two, uh, two data center guys that were on the midnight shift, uh, 11, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., 7.30 a.m., something like that. One of the guys uh, had been around with the company since uh, almost its inception and couldn't figure out why he was on the midnight shift, but then I found out. He was going through a, a user system at one point, just no reason why he went through it. He found some user accounts that he didn't believe should be there. There was no documentation. Why, why is this user account there? So he deleted it. And then he went off shift at 7 a.m. the next day with no documentation as to what he'd done. And the user's calls to the help desk were described as a firestorm. Where are these accounts? Who's managing my system? I'm going to go to another provider. So you have to have the documentation on what's done, how the system's set up, any changes that are made. Get used to documenting. If you don't, if you don't document it, it just, it just didn't happen. Forget it. But you need to keep that documentation. Again, incident preparation, host configurations. You have to have a plan. You base the plan on the functionality associated with the box. I've talked to folks that took the uh, NSA configuration guide and told me, hey, I took the NSA configuration guide, I applied it to this box, and only administrators can log in. Well, then my question is, well, why did you just blindly do it? Just because this is NSA on it? If it doesn't meet the functionality of your box, why are you just doing that? Take some time, think about some of the settings. If they don't make sense, don't use them or modify them to your own needs. But at least you've got the information there that says, hey, based on our policies, I'm not going to have this setting or I'm going to add this other setting. It's that easy. You just write it down. <coughs> Verify and monitor. Because we have the documentation, because we know certain registry settings, because we know certain ACLs, because we know certain system access control lists for auditing, we can go back and verify them. We can also monitor them through the event log. Now, as one of the presentations talked about yesterday, uh, I think it was the PWC guys, there are some settings I wouldn't necessarily set 
you know, file an access audit or file an object access auditing and all the, the objects you can pick. Um, that's a little too much information to go through. There's other ways to handle that particular situation and we're actually going to cover that uh, in the, the presentation after lunch. However, there's other things that you might want to do. Uh, servers, for instance, if you've got a server that's running that just opens you know, maybe a couple processes like a web server, then why not turn on process tracking? That would be a good idea. It's not an you know, overabundance of information. And then we're going to monitor that system by having those log entries, whether it's log entries from the web server, whether it's event log entries, we're going to collect that information. And you can do this all through all sorts of automated means. Now, for those of you that just that work solely on NTN 2000 servers, how many of you are familiar with syslog? Okay. Yeah. Good. If you turn on uh, logging of successful and failed logins, and say somebody gets on your network and tries to break into the box, by the time they get into your box and you have a syslog client sending out that information to a secure syslog server right out of your event log, by the time the person gets into the box, the fact that they tried and then succeeded is already off the box. So they can go ahead and, and run a tool to delete the event log or whatever the case may be or clear it, but it's not going to matter because the information is stored elsewhere at that point. You need to know what you're looking for though. You need to know, I'm going to set this type of auditing on this box. You turn the auditing on, you come back at a later date, make sure it's, you know, verify it, make sure it's still there, and you can do this. Um, just as an example, there was an ISP in Indiana that had 13 free BSD servers and every single night during the lowest period of activity, they ran scripts. The results of the scripts were presented the next day to the system administrators or filtered out the regular expressions and other tools. It's that easy. You know, if they were looking for added files, they just skipped over all the user directories and just looked for specific areas. But they knew their systems. And to be honest, a lot of this stuff can be easily, easily mapped over to NTU 2000. Not all of it, but a lot of it. User privileges, user accounts. Are there any spurious accounts that are there? Uh, in our previous, exam previous example, are there any spurious accounts that are no longer there for whatever reason? Um, the privileges that a user has, again, privilege escalation. Uh, DACLs and SACLs. The DACLs, discretionary access controls, these are file permissions basically. System access controls are if you enable uh, file and object access auditing, then you go to the particular object and you tell it what type of auditing. I want to be informed when this system or this file was read or when it was modified and by whom. And then again, our auditing configuration. There are plenty of freeware tools that will handle this information. You can, you know, for instance, if you're really adventurous, you can write a Perl script that will go through and scan all the systems, all the critical systems that you've identified, find out what the auditing, if it's turned on, find out what, the, what different events are being audited, and if they're not, bring them in compliance with your policies. It's really simple, really straightforward. Again, incident preparation, we've got a multitude of configuration guides that are out there. Again, I recommend against blindly installing any one of them. Uh, I was talking to uh, Mark Burnett earlier. He opened up his laptop. He has a total of 56 different guides of how to configure NT and 2000. And that includes the NIST one. There's a lot of information out there. The MSDN site off Microsoft has some information that you can look up and yes, it does take a little time to, uh, you know, get used to the Zen Buddhist way of doing searches because you don't always get back what you're looking for. But there's a lot of information that you can find in there. The NSA had some good, uh, some good guides, trusted system, system experts. The United States Navy has some good guides. Um, <clears throat> believe it or not, another place to go is the Naval Postgraduate School has, uh, back when I was there, started up an information warfare curriculum. And since then, there have been a lot of very, very good theses that have come out of the information warfare curriculum, the computer science curriculum. So going to the military sites are actually provide a pretty good resource. Um, the, actually, there was an individual that uh, attended the July Black Hat who was working on his thesis of how to configure an exchange box. Excellent resource for information. 
The components of NT2000 security, some of this was covered by the PwC guys the other day, it's just in a little different order. You want to make sure your service packs are up to date based on the functionality of your box. Again, you may not want to ap blindly apply all the service packs and hot fixes. You got to have some testing in there. There's a lot of organizations out there that have proprietary uh, types of utilities that they use, proprietary programs. Um, believe it or not, there are some people that have, you know, major financial organizations that have applications that will only run on NT Service Pack 3. Service Pack 4 breaks it, 2000 breaks it, only run on NT Service Pack 3. Verification. To perform regular testing. In addition to a consulting group coming in and doing an audit or doing an assessment for you, you can do it yourself. Now I've actually seen posts, entire threads on Security Focus where somebody wanted to know, oh, you know, the central office is having an audit and they're going to reach out across the frame relay link and they're going to audit our office too. How do I put a firewall up and prevent them from auditing us? Well, you know, you know maybe there's an issue there with the political infrastructure of the organization, but if you'd gone out and gotten some tools, learned a little bit, learned about your systems, learned what these tools do, you can actually be the bright star in the entire audit. Monitoring, again, event log collection and analysis. Some of this stuff is pretty simple. Yeah, it looks, it looks like a, a big scary beast. There's a lot of information there that doesn't quite make a lot of sense, but at the same time, if you configure your system to audit certain types of events, then you know what it should be auditing. Now, not everything goes into the event log, of course. I mean, you know, we don't, uh, we don't get IP addresses from the systems, we just get NetBIOS names and the resource kit provides tools for changing a NetBIOS name of the system and you know, we've got all these issues to deal with, but there's other things that we can add to that. We can add our, our syslog clients, we can have a syslog server. Kiwi Enterprises provides an excellent, uh, it's Kiwi-Enterprises provides an excellent uh, syslog server uh, for Windows NT and 2000 systems, if that's what you've got, if you don't want to stand up a separate box. And then again, that's my personal favorite, custom Perl scripts. Other resources that you can go to for incident preparation, SANS is a good resource. Um, with some of the certifications that they've got, the certifications require that uh, the individuals you know, write a paper. There's some really good information out there. It may not be complete, and it may be particular to a certain environment, but still. It's information on, on how you can configure your system. CERT's gotten a lot better. Again, Security Focus and the Microsoft Security Site. Malware. Now, <clears throat> these are two URLs I put up here. Uh, I authored the article from uh, the ISB, the Information Security Bulletin. There's actually copies out on the counter for free. Um, that particular article was published last year and distributed in the, the ISB that was distributed at uh, Black Hat in February of last year. Um, basically what I'd done is I'd gone through some testing and I'd set up a test box and I installed Sub7 on it using tools to find out what, what things were changed, what types of things were uh, altered, what things were added to the system. And by observing what type of effect that Sub7, BO2K, and some of these different types of malware had on the system, you're able to devise your, your defenses. You know, for instance, if you say, okay, I don't want users to be able to create files in the System32 directory, you can severely hamper the installation of a lot of these things. If you say the user cannot write to the run key, and then you go to, you can, cannot create subkeys and cannot, you just cannot write to that run key at all. And then you go to the F-Secure site or one of the antivirus sites, look at the number of Trojans and the, 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 the sheer number of malware that write to that key. You can severely hamper the installation and you turn on your file and object access added, auditing and you can detect an attempt at that installation. Malware again defined as Trojans, worms, viruses, rootkits. Now, I, I use the, uh, the plural version of rootkits loosely, of course. Um, I did approach the PwC guys yesterday based on their comments. Uh, there was one specific that said all those rootkits that are out there. And I can only think of one or two that apply directly to NT2000. But that's just what I've been able to find. And what I mean by rootkit, I'm, I'm talking about something that goes in, modifies the kernel so that certain processes and certain uh, TCP IP endpoints can't be observed. How does it get on your system? What's the infection vector? Are you using Outlook? Or uh, do you have somebody in your organization that downloads files all the time? Uh, we've got somebody like that where I work now. It's uh, 
person high up in the organization will go home and burn off CDs with infected files and bring them in and distribute them. And at one point, the system administrator said, hey, did you bring a disk in? Did you bring a disk in and put it in your machine? No, I didn't bring a disk in. Well, what's that round thing right there? Well, it's a CD. That's not a disk. So, you know, going all the way back to policies and procedures, you want to, you want to include that user education. Yes, a disk is a disk is a disk. Uh, persistence. How is the malware persistent on the system? Does it write to the registry? Does it write to the file system? This is an interesting aspect, especially uh, when we're, we're going to come to the presentation after lunch. And then what's the footprint, uh, footprint of the malware? Once you know the effect that a malware has on the system, you can incorporate defenses to that into your day-to-day -day processes, your monitoring, how you set up your boxes. I tell you that one of the best tools that's out there for this is a tool called InControl5. It'll snapshot your entire system, you run whatever tool you want, and then you run the second phase and it'll tell you exactly what's changed. What keys are written to, what keys are created, what files are created, what files are added to, what files are you know, modified or deleted or whatever the case may be. Now, moving on to de developing our methodology, how are we going to identify an incident? Well, first of all, we have to define what an incident is. A lot of organizations don't have, uh, and I'm just saying this based on my experience, I'm sure it's, you know, I'm not talking about anybody in particular in here, but a lot of the organizations that I've been to do assessments are not capable of detecting an incident. Um, one place I went uh, several years ago, while I was on site, uh, the system administrator, senior system administrator approached me and said, hey, we've got this issue we want you guys to look at. You're the security guys, you're here, can you, can you look at this for us? Basically, they just decided to turn on egress filtering on their firewall, and they noticed a huge amount of traffic coming from one box in another office. And this was the first indication that they had that they had an incident. So we went and took a look at it. Uh, I reached out across the enterprise, pulled down some registry values. And basically what it ended up is they had the Attacka Trojan. Um, this is an old Trojan, also called IE0199. Uh, it's a distributed sort of attack Trojan. It doesn't require any control. It was written by a gentleman in Bulgaria who had uh, some issues with the fact that the Bulgarian telecommunications company was charging for internet access. So he wrote a little utility that would get on a system and he distributed it as an update to Internet Explorer. Basically, it just gets on the system and starts spewing packets. So these systems in this organization had no way to prevent or detect a user installing software of any kind. And up until they just decided to turn on egress filtering to see you know, where their bandwidth was going, they really had no way of detecting such an incident. Nobody knew what was going on. You need to have a reporting process. Who do you call? If anybody's familiar with managed IDS, the people that are doing the managing have to have a point of contact. Who's going to get called at 2 o'clock in the morning for a major incident? Not me, that's for sure. Approaching the scene. What type of issues do you have to deal with when you're approaching the scene? You know, I've had incidences where HR would come to me and say, we need to know if this person's doing this. Well, in some cases, I'm not able to approach the scene because they want to know now and the person's across the country. In other cases, that person's within the building and they don't want to have that person or any of the other employees around there know what's going on and start rumors. But I actually have had instances in which HR pulled somebody into uh, their office and uh, myself and uh, one of the uh, other members of the security staff basically hid around the corner and just peeking around waiting until they were gone. And we kind of scurried over there, reached under the counter, pulled all the cables out and took the box upstairs. So how you approach the scene, how you secure the scene, and if necessary, how you document the scene. These are all important to your methodology for incident response. Now when you, when you do some reading about forensics, the high end of incident response, you know, the police officers and the people doing this type of uh, work, consultants for instance, you know, will photograph the scene, will mark the cables, will photograph the back of the machine, will photograph everything to make a record of what, what the situation is and what the scene looks like when they get there. You may also want to involve uh, interviewing any involved parties to find out what's going on. Again, document and protect the scene. You never know when, you know, Murphy is everywhere. You never know when something's going to happen. It's going to be a simple pornography case and the next thing you know, it's going to be a case that mandates letting federal law enforcement know what's going on.
Okay, these things have a way of blowing up. You might want to isolate the system from the network. Don't let anybody approach the console. When I was at Winstar, you know, there's a lot of, uh, like most large companies, there were, there were a lot of political factions within the company. So even though we had a mandated corporate security group and a corporate security officer, and we had policies and procedures for reporting incidences, we still had people that would go off and do their own thing because they knew better. You know, red cape flip waving behind them. Um, in one case, we had somebody that was uh, allegedly uh, bringing in people from India on false visas, VC, on a false visa, and getting them a job with a company as system administrators. And these people had never seen a computer in their lives. So, you know, I, I don't know what went on after that. It was just an allegation. The person, the suspect, was brought into an office and interviewed by HR, and then allowed to go back to his box, unescorted. We were later handed a firewire drive. We were later, later handed an iMac laptop, a couple of IBM laptops, and they said, okay, you guys are the security experts, you do something with this. Oh, wait a minute, I'm not gonna touch it. I'm not gonna go anywhere near it. You let this person go back to that system for an indeterminate amount of time. I don't wanna have anything to do with this. You might wanna protect it from the network as well. Now there may be cases based on the situation where you want to leave it on the network. In the case of the, the Solaris uh, News Group server, you might want to plug into the network and wait for the guy to come back. Is everybody familiar with Clifford Stoll's first book, The Cuckoo's Egg? Yeah, yeah, good reading, excellent reading. One of the things that was pointed out in there is many times when the attacker got into the box, the first command he ran on that Unix box was W. He wants to see what's going on, who's doing what, who's logged in. If they've got finger open, somebody might do a finger query to see if the, the administrator's logged on and just not come to that box if the administrator's logged on at that time. Well, if you plug into the network and you're able to monitor the connections, you'll see the finger queries come in or you'll see the login come in. You know, maybe that's a way of determining, okay, we understand that we have something going on in this box. Let's see what type of traffic is associated with this box. You may want to leave it on the network. But again, that goes back to your policies and procedures. Document what you do. Whatever you do on that system, to that system, near that system, around that system, document it. If you need to, if you need to sit down on the box and do some of the things that we're going to talk about a little bit in a few minutes here, you may want to get to the point where you have a logbook and you have the date, what you did, the exact command line you put into that box, as well as somebody else signing it that you did that and verifying what you did and verifying that that was an okay command to run or just verifying that that's what you did. Because again, Murphy's everywhere. You may need to turn this information over to law enforcement. These, have, these things have a way of exploding. So you may approach a box, it's a sis, simple incident response, pretty straightforward, nothing spectacular, and next thing you know, you may be required to turn that box over to law enforcement. So document what you do. Now this gets into a whole area of, of forensics called evidence dynamics, and I'm not gonna go there today. I'm not gonna talk about that. Uh, I've talked to Egon Casey about this. I've talked to uh, Rob Lee. Um, it's a very, very interesting area, but it also opens up a lot of room for debate. So with the information we've got, I'm not gonna approach that today. I'm not talking about forensics in detail. When we develop a methodology, we want to look at the types of data we hope to get from the box. What are the types of information we're interested in getting from that computer in the, on the basis of an incident? We have volatile, non-volatile data, and we'll go into that. You may actually want to copy files. And again, I keep stressing the point of documented methodology. This isn't necessarily a checklist, I have to do X, Y, and Z. This is a documented methodology that says you can make decisions along the way. I decided not to do this step because, here's my justification, here's why I opted not to do that. Because I didn't know how is not necessarily a good reason. Or I didn't think. But you can, uh, based on information that you collect, you can say, based on this information, there doesn't seem to be a Trojan on the system, so I opted not to do these steps. Okay, that's fine. And then the fun begins later on when you actually start doing some analysis of the data that you, you collect. Volatile data. Data which may be altered or cease to exist if you reboot the machine. Now I know you guys have the slides in front of you, but does anybody have any examples of volatile data? 
What are the types of volatile data? Oh, come on. It's not that bad. Okay, TCP IP endpoints, net stat output. Who's connected to the box from where? What IP addresses, what ports? You get a process listing. Now I list three different tools up here for a reason. PS list is great. It gives you some information you'd expect on processes, the amount of time it's been running. PU list is from the resource kit. It's great too because it gives you the, it gives you the process identifier and basically the owner, who's running it. Process to port mapping, F port, an excellent tool. The people that are on, uh, more familiar with Linux and Unix, you're probably familiar with F user or LSOF. This will give you the same type of information. The idea is, is if a service is running and a port is open, there has to be an executable associated with that. And this is the way, this is the tool that you use to find out what process is using a particular port. Now, going back to what I said earlier about you know, some of the Unix admins will and map the box, which is a great idea, and then go out to a website someplace and say, well look, this 15-year-old out here put up this website and said these are the default ports. <laughs> really, honestly, what good is that going to do you? Clipboard contents. I use PGP a lot. And sometimes, depending on, you know, which email account I get the information in, I'll just copy it to the clipboard and decrypt it. Okay, well, there's a lot of interesting information you can get from the clipboard. DOS key history, very interesting. If anybody uses the command line at all, you go to the dark place, anybody afraid of the dark? <laughs> if you go to the dark place, this is a good, you know, you go to that DOS prompt, the DOS key history is an excellent place to get some information. Find out what commands they were typing in. How are we doing for time? Doing okay. Okay. The network connections, net use, logged on users. This is one of the tools we're going to look at today. Who am I from the resource kit? It's the resource kit version that you want. Gives a lot of good information. Okay, non-volatile data. Data which remains persistent across reboots and logins. The stuff that stays there. Files, permissions, file contents. Now you've got to be careful about this because there are some traps that you can fall into. And what I mean by traps is uh, there's a registry key that says clear the, clear the page file when you reboot. Page file 128 megabytes in some cases, a great place to get some information. Maybe you don't want it cleared. So if the registry key, the registry key is set to do that, you want to go to your notebook or on a piece of paper and you want to write down the fact that I'm going to change that value, how you did it, when you did it, and have somebody say yes, he changed that value if the incident requires that. Uh, files, file contents, and file permissions. Who in here is familiar with NTFS alternate data streams? Anybody heard of that? Great place to find information, great place to hide information? Yeah, great stuff. After lunch though, <laughs> sorry. Uh, user accounts and user information, again, that's privilege escalation. Okay, what is the current state of the system? The reason we're going to collect some non-volatile, or some volatile data rather, is we want to know the current state of the system. Once that system is shut down and you make a copy of the hard drive, yeah, you can get the last access time of that file that's associated with the subserver Trojan, you can get the last access time for that, but if it had been running for a while, you know, if the last access time was a week ago, well, how do you know that that was actually running when you approached the system? So you want to get a snapshot of the system, you want to get some of that volatile information off the system before you shut it down, if that's what you need to do. Follow your methodology. The second bullet, piping that data off of a forensics, or off of the system onto a forensics workstation is what we're going to talk about. Pipe it through a socket, okay? And this is a direct mapping from some of the techniques presented by Kevin Mandia with uh, the Solaris boxes, for instance. It uses some of the same tools. But the idea is, is we're not going to run the tool, write it to a file, and then copy it off by mapping a share. Because that kind of goes around and just modifies the system all the heck. We want to get the open processes. We want to see any network connections. Do we have any shares that are open? Who's connected to the shares? Uh, do we have any open files? When we collect data, when we collect some of that non-volatile data regarding files, the first thing you want to do is collect the MAC times. Collect the, and the MAC times are the last access time, last modification time, and creation times of those files. You want to collect that information because when you copy it, 
When you copy that file, that information is going to be altered on the file itself. If you open that file, the last access date is going to be changed. So you want to collect that information before you do any looking at the files. Okay, one of the tools I've got, uh, basically it's a Perl script that just runs through the file system or just a directory and it spits out that information in a common delimited format that you can open up in a spreadsheet really easy. So you just give it a .csv extension, Excel opens it up. Okay, you want to use tools that ignore the hidden attribute. This is something we get into after lunch as well. Reason being is the default use of the dir command observes the hidden attribute. Now there are tools out there and there are switches to the dir command that will ignore it and will show you files with the hidden attribute set. But you may, be, may just want to use tools that ignore that attribute so you can find those files on the system. Later actions. If you copy a file, you, want to, you may want to go back later and say, did that file have an alternate data stream associated with it? Or did it have more than one? Okay, we're going to walk through a demonstration using Netcat and Cryptcat, which is just a encrypted version of Netcat. And the last little bullet down here is something I've kind of been working on on my own. It's call, I, I call it generically right now the Forensic Server Project. But the idea is that by copying tools to a CD and running the server on a forensics workstation, you can actually automate the copying of information. You can get that that volatile data off the system. And also, when you copy a file, if you want to copy a file off the system, you want to collect the access times, but before you copy it, you want to generate an MD5 checksum. Now, for those of you familiar with MD5 checksums, this is just a, a mathematical uh, algorithm that gives a unique fingerprint or a unique ID to a file. And that's, you know, there's some debate. <laughs> we can get into discussions about the math, but the idea is any particular file will have a unique identifier based on this MD5 checksum. So what you want to do is you want to generate the MD5 checksum before you copy the file, copy the file, and then generate it again afterwards to ensure that the file wasn't modified in the copying process. And the idea of the Forensic Server Project is to automate some of that so you can just select a file and all these checks that I've talked about, getting the MAC times, getting the owner of the file, checking for alternate data streams, checking, uh, doing your MB5 checksums and doing SHA-1 checksums, doing all that can be modified or can be automated rather. Um, again, copying the files, you want to generate your checksums, what other data are we looking for? Again, the MAC times, the owner of the file, any permissions associated with the file, who can access it. You might also want to throw in there the uh, system access control list to find out if any auditing was turned on on the file. Because that may be a clue if there was auditing turned on on the file and you think that file had been accessed and there's no entry in the event log, you know, now there may be something going on there. Alternate data streams again, and then any DOS attributes associated with the file. Data analysis. Develop a timeline of activity. MAC times again. Now the last write times associated with registry keys. This is an interesting little subject. I wrote a utility that will collect the lax access times from a registry key. And I'll, I'll show you a quick demonstration of that. The reason being is on NT, the telnet command is a GUI, correct? You type telnet and it pops up in a GUI box. It has a little drop down list of all the, you know, the different servers and ports that had been connected to previously. All that information is stored in the registry under the, under the, the telnet key. So if you suspect that you've got somebody on your system, one of your employees is trying to access uh, either telnet servers outside the system or is trying to break into routers, for instance, if that's what you suspect and the traffic is on port 23, then one of the things you can do is collect the last access time from that key. And this only works on NT. It doesn't work on 2000. But you collect the last access time or the last write time from that key and the data in the key will tell you the last server that they t attempted to connect to. And the last write time will tell you when. Correspond that to when they were logged in. You've got plenty of information uh, that will at least get to the fact that it was this person doing it. Information from event logs and information from other logs as well if you're collecting I IIS web server logs. Um, Analyzing files, passive analysis, file signatures, we're going to get into that after lunch. Uh, tools from the resource kit, depends, okay? This is an interesting little tool. It's a GUI, you open it up, 
You open up uh, an EXE in this tool and it tells you all, all of the uh, DLLs that that file depends on. Uh, Gene Schultz sent me a file, uh, asked me to take a look at it. I used the depends tool. Uh, somebody had sent him the file and was concerned that this tool was some sort of Trojan. Well, the tool didn't rely on any of the DLLs that, that basically connect to the network, that provide network connections. So with a relatively, you know, with a relative level of certainty, I could tell, no, it's not a Trojan. And it just turned out it was just some kind of game, some silly game. But it's a very useful tool for doing analysis. Um, the Perl script uh, fInfo, it gets the resource information from the file, just like file version does. Now, there's a resource section to some of the executable files, uh, DLLs, EXEs, and it's particularly easy to see in Microsoft utilities. Uh, it gives file version information, company information, uh, all sorts of neat little strings that are in there. Not all companies provide this information, not all authors provide this information, but it's still a place to go to, to kind of get some information on the file. What version are you using? If you did a scan and there was this utility on your system and it's a DLL, and the last time you checked it had file version information and then something happened and now it doesn't, that could be an indicator of what happened. Uh, strings is a utility that uh, most folks uh, on Unix are familiar with. There's a version of strings available from sysinternals. And then bin text is a, a strings-like utility. It's a GUI from uh, Foundstone. Yes, question in the back. Has uh, Depends been updated to detect when you're using load library? Has Depend been updated to detect when you're using load library? To be honest, I've never really looked. I never really checked that. Can anybody provide any information? You know, you may want to go to the resource kit and, and check it out. <coughs> it's a good question. Okay, again, analyzing files. Uh, we got some active analysis. We can use the API monitor from the resource kit. Uh, FileMon, RegMon, and DirectoryMon from SysInternals. Great little tools to use. I used FileMon and RegMon in addition to other tools while I was looking at the effects that malware had on a system. Okay, doing good on time. Other areas that you want to look at, you might want to do some network analysis. Etherreal is very good. It's recently been updated. Uh, I found that it loads a little faster. It's a GTK, GTK based interface, so it doesn't look like your regular Windows, but still it's a very, very useful tool. There's other useful sniffer tools that are out there if you want to do some network analysis, and believe it or not, a lot of them are freeware. The WinPCAP libraries from, I think it's a university in Italy, and then the tools that rely on those, like uh, Loftcrack 3 for the sniffing capability, WinDump, Analyzer, Etherreal, some excellent tools to have in your, re in your kit. However, one thing you want to make very, very sure of is that in your policies or in your processes, you want to make sure that you have authorization to use those tools. Some places say no sniffer tools allowed, and then they have an issue because some system administrators are running around you know, using these tools in instant response. So you kind of got an issue there. How can you, if you have a system administrator who's using the sniffer tools for other reasons, how can you get rid of him or how can you punish him if your policy says no sniffer tools whatsoever? So your policies need to fit your organization. So, okay, before we go into the demos, got a couple of quick examples to show tools. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, you were first. I got a question on policy. Okay. Um, don't you think it's necessarily clearly defined policy? Yes, I do think it's important to clearly define your policies. However, again, policies are platform independent statements. The reason being is, do you want to rewrite your policies every time you update your password policy, for instance? Don't you think it's necessary? If your policies are clear and defined, don't you think you're just creating gray areas, especially during investigations? Yes and no. The purpose of the procedures, I think, in my opinion, the purpose of the procedures is to provide and get rid of those gray areas, provide clarity. But procedures are just suggestions. Mm, depend on, depends on how they're written. Now, you and I had a conversation earlier. You know, maybe thou should, vice thou shalt. But that has to be written in policy, not procedure. Mm. You know, maybe we, we can approach this afterwards. It, it's sounding to me like it's getting into just a semantic issue. You know, I, I'm not defining to you how to write your policies. I'm saying, 
this is how I approach policy writing. I've written policies for the IRS. Which, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> no, not too proud of that. But uh, I've written policies before. They've been very effective. I've seen other people write policies. Uh, the policies, the actual overall policy statements, the overarching policy statements, were written for Windstar. Were written by Jay Heiser before I showed up. If anybody's familiar with Jay, and he got them right out of the Crescent Wood book. So if, I'm more than happy to address this, this question for you, but maybe this is something we can take up afterwards. Okay, you had a question? Well, I had a comment about, okay. those, about those policies. Sure. sure they include that the team does have the right, you know, to read this email and to look at the personal files and all that sort of thing when you're doing this. Event. Okay, we got a very good point. Your policies and procedures, again, however you want to use that term, you need to clearly state that members of the incident response team have the right to monitor employees. This is usually, in my experience, been handled in a consent to monitoring statement, either signed at the moment of employment or signed regularly a year, you know, at a regular basis afterwards. There are some organizations that have uh, policy statements that need to be read and a signature page needs to be printed out on an annual basis. Now this is good for small companies, 300, 350 people, all in the same building. Director of HR can walk up to each person and find out, okay, why didn't you sign this document by this date? Why didn't you turn it in? Okay, larger dispersed organizations, that may not work. But you're right, it needs to be clearly understood by the employees that yes, there may be instances in which your email inbox needs to be accessed, your files need to be accessed. And it could be, you know, totally innocuous, we're just trying to track down something or it could be actual, an actual part of an investigation where they're actually looking for information. I've had to do that before as part of fraud investigations. Um, that sort of thing <laughs> without going into too much detail. Okay, great. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. Show you some of the tools that are out there. And you can just follow along on this. Okay, uh, let's see, everybody, everybody see that clearly? Okay, good. Um, I've been working with this particular DOS prompt, uh, setting up the presentation and whatnot, so I guess that gives us an excellent opportunity. This is an actual command that's on the system. This is one of the ones, I, I teach an incident response class and this is one of the ones I like to use. You know, you type in a bunch of commands, type CLS, minimize the DOS prompt, and see what happens when the user comes up to the system. This isn't particularly interesting, uh, but it does show, it, it keeps a record of commands, what the person did. If anybody was at all interested in, in the, the Mitnick stuff that went on, um, some of the stuff that was put up on the takedown site were actually bash histories, and some of the information was actually put into like a, a little Java applet where it actually showed where mistakes were made and the person, you know, supposedly, allegedly Mitnick had backspaced over, corrected the command, or typed in the wrong command. It's very, very useful. Okay, some of the utilities that we've got. It's in the demo page here. Ah, oh, good. Let's start with audit policy. Audit policy is available from the resource kit or audit Paul, for instance. And you can include these, these, some of these tools that I'm gonna show you, you can also include in your uh, process for configuring your systems. Now, I've just used Audit Paul to collect the information from the system, and with the two unknown entries at the bottom, I probably need to check on the version that I'm using. But you can see here, you can actually get the information about the system, or about the auditing function on the system. First of all, we see that it's enabled, that's good. Now, with a lot of these tools, not all of them, and it's, it's interesting that this applies mostly to the Microsoft utilities that come on the system. You can actually type something like that and get a little bit of information about the utility. So you can find out what the various syntaxes, syntax usages are. See, for instance, you can tell it, go to this computer and enable auditing. Okay, but you can also see why uh, some authors of some books have referred to the resource kit as the Microsoft Hacking Kit. Because with the ability to disable auditing, if somebody's gonna get into your system, well, you know, I might, I might use an executable compressor on this thing before I actually used it, but I would include that, especially on a penetration test. Disable auditing and then use a tool to just clear the event log. Okay, some other utilities that we've got that you can use. Um, 
Oh, file version is good. File version, and we'll go ahead and run file version against itself. There we go. Yeah, not very verbose output, but you can see in the middle of the screen here we've got a version number, what type of executable it is, uh, the attributes, the type of executable it is, uh, the file size. Uh, some nice information that comes out of that. And you can again use this for your auditing and also use it to collect information. Um, let's look at some of the processes. PS list is a utility from the Sys Internals website. You can actually use it to get information on remote computers as well if you're a domain admin. And this tells you the different types of utilities that are running or the different processes that are running rather. Uh, the process identifiers, how long they've been running. You can see I've got a lot of things going on in the system here. A couple of interesting places to hide Trojans. You'll see FindFast is running. When you install Microsoft Office on a system, it puts FindFast in. A great place to put a Trojan is to just overwrite the FindFast executable. You know, don't mess with anything else, forget the registry. You know? uh, another one is uh, service host. You see two entries up there. There's a Microsoft Knowledge Base article on uh, actually default processes on Windows 2000. And it specifically states there will be multiple versions of this running. Okay, well, let's see. Hmm. Take the sub-7 server, call it service host. Install it on the system. Somebody wants to look into it, they go to the MSDN site, oh, it's okay, there's multiple versions running. Microsoft said it's okay. What well, Microsoft said, yeah. Okay, PU list from the resource kit. Now here we have some very interesting information. We have the, again, we have the processes running, the process IDs, and who's the owner? In this case, uh, some of the processes, hot sync, PGP tray, all that, that's me, administrator. The box name is KBAR. Comes from my background. Oh, as, speaking of the background, an approach you don't want to take for who, who here is in the military or military experience? Okay? The approach you do not want to take when writing policies is that military experience. Now, uh, other things that don't work is because I'm the mommy, that type of thing. It's, it's part of a team function. You kind of have to coerce and coax the employees into following the policies, I guess. But I found one of the biggest roadblocks. Other than uh, senior VPs that don't follow the policies, one of the biggest roadblocks is using that military mentality. And I, I come from the extreme side, the Marine Corps. It's do it, no questions asked. Uh, that really doesn't work <laughs> in these types of environments. Just rely on my experience for that. Okay. Now what I do want to show you is a way we can get this information off of the box. And we're going to use a utility called Netcat. Uh, this is available from uh, at the At Stake website now, originally from Loft. Excellent utility referred to as the Swiss Army Chainsaw, and that applies. So the first thing we're going to do, and I'm going to run it locally on this box, but just to show you, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to open up a Netcat listener, okay? And uh, I have tested this, and I'm sure it'll work, but as you saw with some of the presentations the other day, you know, even computers that run normally most of the time tend to lock up in the middle of a presentation, so it's just Murphy's Law. Uh, lowercase l for listen, dash p, and we had the dash v for verbose. I mean, this is pretty straightforward stuff. And actually, if we just take it back and uh, we want to get some help, there's our help information. This is the syntax, how to use the tool. Um, the tool was ported over from the Unix environment, so the information it provides is pretty good. Okay, so we go ahead and we write, we want verbose, we want to listen. And we want to listen on a port, and one, two, three, four, five, to make it easy. And anything that comes across this particular socket, we're going to dump it to a file, okay? My file.txt. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and run that. So, see, we're listening. In the interface, port one, two, three, four, five. Go and open to this one. And, oh, I know. Here we go, who am I? Excellent utility. You want to find out who's logged onto the box, or you want to find out the privilege level of who's on the box. Now again, you will find versions of who am I out there that come in some of these uh, Unix-oriented kits. Okay. Um, however, the tool you want to get is from the resource kit. You want that one because it has this nice little switch. A-L-L. -L. Look at all that information. Gives you all the privileges, which privileges this person has. Uh, in this case, I'm the administrator. Gives you the groups. 
Now I hope, and I haven't tried it because I haven't, I don't have nested groups set up, but I would hope that the version from the resource, uh, the Windows 2000 resource kit would deal effectively with nested groups. Okay, so that's the type of information we're going to get from that utility. So let's go ahead and scroll down. There we go. And we're going to run who am I, but we're going to pipe it through the netcats socket and we're going to go to 345. Okay. Now we're going to use the loopback address. Now, again, one, I mentioned the forensic server project uh, that I'm working on. Um, I'm, I'm not a, I, I don't write GUIs. I write command line stuff mostly. Uh, and that's really the process that's slowing me down is writing a GUI that's easy to understand. Um, you know, most people know, who reads documentation? Real men don't read instructions, right? Okay. Now that'll be the downfall of society. Anyway. We're going we're gonna to pipe this out, and the Forensic Server Project, is, is the purpose is to automate all this. In fact, one of the neat things I found is that using uh, the programming language, you can actually say, when you start the process on the Forensics Workstation, you can say only accept connections from one particular IP address or one particular range of IP addresses. Hopefully that will prevent attacks on the Forensics Workstation to some degree. But we're going to send this information out. Okay. Give it a second. It doesn't return. That's got something to do with the pipe. But we give it a second. Control C. Then we go back to our other window. There we go. Now, open up Notepad. Bless you. There we go. Now, what we've done here is we have a victim workstation. We call it the victim. Something's happened on the system. We've got a lot of volatile information. We've got clipboard information. I'll give you an example of that. There's a little utility um, from uh, a little zipped archive called Unix Utilities. I, I think it's actually on SourceForge, as a matter of fact. So if you look for Win32 and Unix on SourceForge, you'll actually find this kit. But it's called pclip. So what I will do is just copy a bunch of this information here up to the clipboard, okay, and then I'll go down and type pclip, there we go. That's all the stuff I copied, it gives you, just basically dumps the contents. So we've got all this information that's available to us, this volatile information that we can get off the system, and maybe even some non-volatile information that we just want to get off the system before we make any other decisions. You know, we'll, we'll collect this information, we'll maybe copy a couple of files, we'll check some uh, last write times on registry keys, we'll check some contents of registry keys, and then we'll unplug the system. We might leave it on, but we'll unplug the system from the network, and then maybe come back to it later. But we have a way of getting that information off, getting it onto a forensics workstation without writing the file to the victim, and without making any significant alterations to that victim system. Okay, does anybody have any questions at this point? Any questions at all? Everybody's experts in this already? Okay. <sighs> Tough crowd. Okay. We'll look at a couple other. Ah, here's some good ones. You want to find out how long the system's been up? Again, the PS uh, toolkit from SysInternals, PS Uptime. This system, this particular system's only been on for a little over an hour. Okay, but these are great little utilities. If we want to find out what the syntax is, oops. Yep. Querying question mark. Oh. SysInternals likes to put their documentation on, the, on their website, not included in their files. But um, now we've got other things, other, other bits of information we can collect. We've already looked at PU list. You want to get the running services, SC list. There we go. Now, the gentleman that gave the presentation from PwC yesterday talked about other information associated with services. You've got things like what account it's running under, what's the path to the executable. You might well also want to go so far as determine the permissions on the executable. There's a Perl script on my website that's accessible from the, the URL I gave you at the presentation that actually does all that and it dumps it out into a format that can be opened up in Excel. Now these are, these are basically some tools I developed based on a need that I had. 
and I'm just making them available to whoever wants to use them. So we look at services that are currently running. This is a snapshot of what is running right now on the system because, you know, we can use things like net start, net stop, depending on the level of access that we have to go ahead and start running certain services. Now maybe the startup information is that it started manually or it's not started at startup for a particular service, but you can find out what services are currently running and there's also other information associated with the services you might want to get. So we've looked at processes, uh, we want to look at um, any open files from the network, okay, no files are currently open. Now depending on the information regarding the running services, if the server service has started, maybe you want to check on the shares that are available, maybe there's some shares that have been created. You know, the guys from PwC yesterday pointed out a lot of tools that you've got. I mean, one of the simplest ones is already on the system. Okay. I don't have any shares available. There's, there's nothing on this list. No. Besides the uh, hidden administrative shares. You don't need net share? You want to list what shares are? Oh, yeah, you're right. I apologize. Net share rather than net view. I apologize. Net shave. There we go. No, I wasn't out partying last night. So when's this? 12 o'clock. Okay, we got four minutes. Anybody have any questions? Please, a question. Yes, you again, the same guy that's been asking questions. You probably have this information on your website, but what version or variety of Perl do we need to run your Perl? Oh, okay. The question was, uh, there's probably this information available on my website, but what version of Perl do you use? Uh, no, it's not available on the website. However, just go to Active State and download the latest one. Active State Perl, it's free. Um, there are some other modules that are available. Some of them are a little bit, a little bit difficult to, uh, to install with the automated process. Um, Dave Roth's website is an excellent place to go get, get utilities. It's roth.net. Um, however, Dave has almost, he's uh, a great guy, he has almost religious preferences for namespace. So that has presented some complications with installing a couple of his uh, modules. But that's okay, they're, they're easy to, you know, you just move the files around. Yes? But I've heard that if you're going to do an investigation, what you really want is a byte for a byte copy of the hard drive. Do you agree with that? Okay, the question was if you really want to do an investigation, you want to make a byte for byte copy. We're getting into forensics, okay? Now, the reason I wanted to talk about incident response and share this information with everybody here today and share it with the world is that you don't always need to do that, okay? Because what happens? If you're going to do an investigation of prosecution that leads to prosecution, are the people in the company necessarily going to be the ones to do the forensics analysis? Or does that present a conflict of interest? Or if not, do you want to pay for somebody to come in? Okay, some people get paid enormous amounts of money to do this type of thing. And it takes a long time to copy the, copy the hard drive and it takes a long time to run some of these string searches. And at a rate of four to $500 an hour, depending on what company you're talking to, do you really want to pay that amount of money for what you're trying to protect? Well, you've, you've made a big point about not touching the hard drive so far, so you're not disturbing anything with a lot of things that you're doing, which I think is great. Right. And actually making a backup copy of a hard drive, you can buy a $400 device you can stick in your pocket sure. to clone an IDE drive. Right. And this way, if you decide later you want to do something, you still have the original hard drive. Okay. And so you, know, you don't have to pay four or $500 an hour. Anybody can clone hard drives to do this. Right. But you also want to look at what type of system you're looking at. Now, if this is a user system, it may not be any problem for you to make the bit level copy of the hard drive during lunch. No big deal. But what if it's a production system? What if it's a critical system that cannot go down? What if it's a billing system? How many thousands of dollars are lost per hour of downtime for something like that? And when all you really want to know is, did something happen, and if so, what? Yes, sir. What if it has a 40 terabytes of data on it? <laughs> Yeah, what if it has 40 terabytes of data? That's going to take a while. Yes, in the back. And without taking the system down, there's no way to find out if something is happening. You, no, you have no trusted base in the system. I mean, to a degree, yes. To a degree, yes. I think Jesper brought that up yesterday. Uh, that gets into the subject of creating uh, statically linked binaries on your CD. It doesn't even help. I mean, if, if, if the uh, operating system has been compromised, then all bets are off. Um, I, I tend to disagree with that. 
And I, I say that because even talking to some of the other people that have taken cases to prosecution, forensics analysts, they're really, yes, you're right, you cannot 100% trust the system. But most of the cases that I've talked to people about and most of the investigations that I've done, there's been literally no sophistication in the attack. There's been no attempts to really hide the fact that they were on there. So I would agree with you with the statement that you, know, you cannot 100% trust the system, but you can collect information from the system to determine, okay, we think something happened, what might it be? And then make your decision from there. You may find enough information that justifies taking that production system down and doing that analysis or taking it down and replacing the system altogether. But what I wanted to give you was some tools and some processes and some thought processes to go about making that decision because I don't think that you can leap immediately from the Homer Simpson phase all the way down to the prosecution phase in one big jump. That doesn't fit. That's like taking the NSA guide and mapping it over onto a Windows 2000 box that you're going to give to a user 100%. It doesn't work that way all the time. I'm not here to give you exact answers on what you need to do for your infrastructure. I'm here to give you the tools that you need to do to hopefully that, you, know, you can make the decisions. I've seen too many people that simply fall in the Homer Simpson phase. The folks at the data center at Windstar were never, never came to me to report an incident. The incident was reported to them 100% of the time by customers. Sadmin IIS ran rampant through the system and we're still cleaning it up. They did no monitoring whatsoever. Okay? You, you need to have those thought processes that we've talked about today. How do we prevent things from happening? How do we detect that they happen? What's our incident response process? What's our procedure? What's our policy for incident response? And for your organization, once you walk through that process, and hopefully it's not going to be dumped on your shoulders alone because if we talked about today, it shouldn't be. But once you've walked through that process, you have something that makes sense for you. You know, I can, I can sit up here and say, this process made sense for the infrastructure that I was working with at this time. But it won't work for you guys. It may or may not. Anything else? Yes. Uh, in reference to his question down there about not disturbing the data and your remark about wanting to get the volatile data off of the machine. Right, yes. How am I going to install Netcat on the box? Ah, how am I going to install Netcat on the box? It's on the CD. It's on the CD. You take a CD. Can you, okay, you can run it from the CD. I've never yeah. ran yeah. from the CD. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Now, one thing you might also want to do is include a copy of cmd.exe. Okay? Every tool you need. CD. Yes, okay. Okay. every tool you need. But what we do is we're getting into an area that the folks on using Unix and Linux systems are better able to handle. Or let's put it this way: we're not able to handle an anti 2000 system at all regarding libraries. Yes. Which brings up another possibility: you can like go to uh, Fred Cohen's site. Okay. And download. He has like a uh, you know, he has a toolkit CD. Right. That's the version of Linux that runs off the CD. You can mount the NT file system and then make the copy from there. It's not going to touch okay. your uh, your time. Right. Did everybody get that? Getting a uh, a version of Linux that runs off the CD, just sticking it in and running it. That's another possibility. All.net. Yeah. Uh, Fred Cohen's site is all.net. Uh, another utility that uh, that might be useful is lists DLLs from sysinternals. This provides a lot of information, very useful. You see, it, <laughs> it just keeps kind of going. Yeah. There you go. Whew, God, it's about time. All right, let's go up and look at one of the look at some of the information and, and this but this I'm not just running this after as an afterthought I want to show you some things about this that pertain to copying the tools of CD uh, for instance we have uh, PID 720 PID 720 the command line is notepad myfile.txt great piece of information what was the command line that launched this process okay now we have okay here's a listing of 
the files and DLLs, the executable and DLLs that it relied upon associated. Now, excuse me, when you statically compile or statically link the uh, utilities that you use on Linux, for instance, you've got everything you need on that CD. It doesn't have to access any libraries. However, because of the way NTN2000 is set up, if you approach a victim system and the first thing you do is you flush, or if you can, flush all the DLLs out of memory because you assume that none of them are trusted, you therefore break everything in the system. I mean, everything from explore because it relies on so many DLLs. So if you flush them out and you, copy, you say, well, I'm going to copy all my DLLs to the CD, you're going to present yourself with a lot more problems. And you're not going to, you're not going to be able to get all this information pertaining what happened to the system. If that's what you want to do, you might as well just take the steps, shut the system down, make your bit level copy of the drive if, if that's what you want to do. Of course, the answer for everything on Microsoft is reboot, right? <laughs> so when in doubt, reboot. Okay. So we presented some tools, methodologies, and, and again, I just want to impress upon you the point that I'm not here to dictate what you do for your infrastructure. I'm here to provide you with some information. You know, I've seen, I've seen system administrators on NT2000 that never touch the command line. Now the reason we use a lot of these command line tools, especially when we're going to get the information off the system, is what? Text. Well, yes, you need text. Any tool that sends its information, sends its output to standard output, can be piped through that socket and sent over to, over the network, to that forensics workstation. Now, utilities like Notepad, for instance, what are the options? It doesn't say launch Netcat. It says save file, or save file as. I mean, that's your choice. So you're going to create a file on the system. And you don't want to do that. Now, depending on the situation, you may. You may not care. It could be uh, a user system that you're going to just flash the drive anyway with Ghost. It really depends on your architecture. You know, a lot of the presentations that, have, that went on yesterday and a lot of them, that, you know, like this one today, it seems like we're not really, you know, it might seem like we're not really providing you with a lot of information. But I, I think we are. We are providing you with the information you need to make the decisions and decide what you need to do. Okay, everybody ready for lunch? Okay. All right, well, I, I would uh, enjoin you to come back for the data hiding. It's a little more interesting. It's not quite as dry. And uh, thank you very much.